<coughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to Classical Revolution here on IDAGIO. My name is Rachel Fenlon, and this is my weekly series in which I'm exploring what it means to kind of break rules in classical music, pushing boundaries, talking, thinking outside the box in classical music. And I'm joined by weekly guests who are people that really inspire me and sort of challenge me with these subjects. My guest today is Christian Joost, a prolific composer and conductor. Christian is shaping the contemporary musical world in opera, in grand symphonic and orchestral works, and in chamber music. He's been commissioned and uh, has premiered his works with the large, um, all the largest theaters and um, orchestras of the world, including the Berlin Philharmonic, the Concert House Berlin, the Grand Théâtre de Genève, the Théâtre an der Wien, Zurich Opera, and in Asia with the Taiwan Philharmonic and Shanghai Symphony. Christian is based in Berlin, and for the last five years, he curates and moderates a series at the Concert House titled Zwei Mal Hören, which sort of roughly translates to Let's Hear It Twice. A very interesting series, which we'll actually talk about today in the interview. Um, as well as this, he is uh, exclusively published with shot music, and you can hear all of his wonderful, uh, wonderful music with uh, labels such as Deutsche Grammophon, Berlin Classics, and with Capriccio. So please welcome Christian Joost. Hi, Christian. Hi, Rachel. Nice for welcome. having you there. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Ida Idagio. Thank you. Very pleased very to be there. Very nice to have you. Um, Christian, I, I love to begin by just hearing sort of the, your earliest experience with, with music and what your earliest interactions were with music and whether there were particular musical moments or musical memories for you. Uh, yes, there were actually quite a little crazy, I have to say. It was in my, um, in my hometown in Trier, which is in the southwest of, of Germany. And it's the, the oldest town of Germany. And um, my mother was by this time, actually she's now 94 years old and not so crazy about opera anymore. But at this time she was very, very crazy. And we listened to um, actually a record of an opera every Sunday together. And uh, she started with Elektra by uh, Richard Strauss. And I was... Oh, wow. <laughs> She, she is this kind of person who goes uh, for the heavy stuff sometimes, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and uh, so this was, as far as I can remember, something, uh, it, it was a first encounter with, with this kind of uh, music and I was around something between 10 and 12 uh, uh, years old. And, um, and that really hit me. Uh, without knowing anything about it, without knowing anything, what it's what it will be, or who was the composer, or something. Um, but um, um, music was playing a very big part in my in, in my childhood from my parents, although they were both uh, no musicians at all. My father was an architect, and um, uh, but he considered himself as kind of an artist, so he was quite supportive in this. And did you begin on an instrument or, I mean, you are a pianist as well. Oh God, yes. It, I, <laughs> I had to, to learn the, uh, uh, I don't even know, what, what's, the, what's the English word for blockflöte, uh, recorder? Okay. Yes, yeah. I hated it. I hated it so, so incredibly deeply. And I wanted to have piano lessons. And, yes. um, but my mother said, no, first you need to learn uh, the recorder, the uh, blockflöte. Okay. So okay, I took some I took some lessons, but I, it was so boring, and I could not I could not play a harmony. It was I didn't like the sound at all. I don't like the sound until today. I hope all the recorder players will excuse me somehow. But but it's it's uh, yes. And um, uh, so I I I stopped this. At, it was at the age of six or seven. I stopped this um, uh, then quite soon because it was mm -hmm. really not my cup of tea. And then I started uh, very early with piano lessons. And so the, before actually my, my, my main goal was being a composer, I, I wanted to be um, a pianist and, um, and a conductor. 
Uh -huh. So, and that's what I what I what I studied uh, actually first <clears throat> later on, and um, because composition was always something I did very naturally, I was oh. not really thinking about it. I, I uh, so I didn't consider this as a as a profession because I just somehow did it, and I didn't thought that it might will be something uh, what. Um, what is something what you do in the in the future as a as a profession? You know, I, mm -hmm. I thought uh, you you be a pianist or you be a conductor. So and um, but then it turned out that it was really much more um, was getting much more important. And I, I I and then I didn't do a decision of being this or that. It was a natural kind of a natural flow somehow. Uh -huh. Yeah. Very interesting. But, but you know, it was not for me so much that, that um, uh, since, since jazz and was playing a very, very big role for me. And, and yeah. um, uh, so the whole, maybe, maybe this is something what I still, what is still the major goal of any composition I do for me, that it is all in a kind of a natural flow. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that, that the music has, has, um, has a goal where, where, where it's going to and that, um, the composition has to flow too. It really has to come out naturally with all the complexities of different layers or whatever, but it, it really has to have a, a natural flow because <laughs> it always was for me something which is not on top of something or something what I have to, to, to think of. Uh, it's really something what, what, what comes out. Yeah, and very, very naturally yourself very authentic. I hope so. Um, yeah, <laughs> well, I think so. <laughs> um, Kristen, you've written 11 full-length operas, is that right? I think um, so. Yes. Yes. I'm afraid, yes. <laughs> Highly impressive, uh, in that in itself. Um, and and what, what's wonderful about exploring your work, um, sort of preparing for our chat today, was how how dynamic and powerful each of each of your operas are, and they're really contrasting. And I read I, I read in a, in a couple of interviews that you've given previously that you really believe greatly in the power of storytelling. Um, and a question that kept coming up for me was, how do you feel the form of opera deepens storytelling? Um, you you mean uh, um, storytelling through opera or? Um... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that the, the the art form opera is really something what um, what is by far not as conservative as actually someone could think of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although for lots of people, it's something what only rich people would do or would go into an opera house, and and you need to be nicely dressed and and all that kind of. Um, things what keeps you away from an opera house but but naturally like for you as you 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 are a wonderful singer too so it's it's uh, no we, we are living people we are living now we we are we are contemporary people and we do not do something with is coming from mars you know we do something which is totally natural and yeah. which which um which is the 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 the, the spiritual and emotional identity of uh, well, if it comes to opera and to classical music, which is the spiritual and emotional identity of, of, of Germany, I would say. Mm -hmm. But um, no, by, by with, with storytelling, storytelling in opera. So I, I always thought in, in my operas, people should not hesitate in terms of being dressed, all this kind of stuff. Um, it should be like going into the movies. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And so that's why also, my operas, um, uh, actually, Hamlet is my, is my longest, which is uh, two hours and something, yeah. two hours and 20 or something. But most of my operas, all something between 90, 100, and 110 minutes. Yeah. And, um, but what I, what I try to do always is, is uh, telling something what is from... Um, from a contemporary living view of the people, you know, because it is for the people. That doesn't mean that it is not complex. It is actually <coughs> sometimes too complex. 
but um, but uh, I really I really think that opera is a kind of um, kind of a miracle if all this comes together, which is although very seldom, yeah. But if it all comes together, then it is really a miracle, and it's the the most the most incredible art form uh, mankind has invented. Absolutely. It's interesting that you mention film right away because that was going to be another question for sure I wanted to ask you is, is what the influence of that industry, the film and cinema, has had on you as a composer and particularly with opera? Um, I, I actually get asked this question quite, quite, quite often and actually very often by, by directors too. Okay. And um, by all our directors, and you know, today we have a little tendency that that um, sometimes I think lots of opera directors would actually rather do film, but unfortunately they have to direct an opera. So I'm I'm a little mean now, but it's it's not as I totally mean it. But but sometimes it's not the same for composers. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no. <laughs> I don't know, but it certainly is not for me. I, I um, because there is a huge, huge difference between okay. between film and opera, because as an as an opera composer, you tell completely not only the story, you complete, you tell everything through mm -hmm. music, mm -hmm. and so um, there's uh, uh, it always. I totally believe there is prima la musica, and not not even. Uh, um, the word is the most important, yeah, yeah, although yeah. it is very important, but the word is only the, the key that leads you to the doors and the rooms of the music. And so, and that's, that's a total different approach in film. In film, yes. you, you, have, you, have, you have visualization, you have, uh, and then you have a music what gives you some atmospheric hints, but that's not opera. Opera, the music in opera gives everything. It gives the timing, it gives the emotions, it gives the, the psychological of the, of the figures. It gives, uh, it, it, leads, it leads to everything. It's the, it's, it's the universe itself and anything else are the, are the little, are the doors to lead into this universe. And that's the main difference between opera and film. And that's, and since my um, since I'm a composer and I totally believe in the in music because I think this is one of the yeah it's actually if opera is is a wonderful musical uh, uh, a miracle invention of of mankind then then music is is the most fantastic invention of of <laughs> mankind yeah although it's only um, air putting into vibration, but, but still um, it, has, it has a subtlety what you never can reach with anything else. And you can never hit people in wherever, okay. in, the, in your heart, in your mind, in your, in, in your soul, in everything, than just with, a, with uh, some, with some um, sounds, whatever yes. they are or where they come from. Yeah. I love that. It, it also, it brings to mind a quote that I read of yours in another interview, which I wanted, I wanted to talk about. And it, it's exactly about this, um, the subtlety. Um, I'm gonna read the quote for, for the audience. Um, so it's regarding the future of composition. And you say, as long as composers have the ability to speak to people in their time and to allow space for subtle, tense and emotional listening, there, there's no question about the future of composition and a future of this kind of music. And I thought it was such a great quote for, for several reasons. And one thing I particularly wanted to ask you about was um, what that allowing the space means to you. Um, so allowing the space for this kind of listening, uh, this subtle listening, this tense listening. That's a rather good quote. Did I say that? Yeah. This yeah. Is <laughs> it's a very good quote. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, um, you know, now in, in these COVID-19 times, we, we talk about a lot of how relevant is art. 
Yeah. 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 And, um, and then uh, you hear people say, yeah, it's very relevant because we, we, uh, uh, we need it somehow. It's like food or, or um, yes, that's certainly right. But <coughs> it's not only that. It's really something what makes us as humans complete. Hmm. Without, without art, it's, it's, we are just little working ants. And that's no matter what, what we do, but we do it for some sake of profit or we do it for making a better life or what, whatever. Of course, we artists want to have a decent life too. There's no question about that. Yeah. But what we give to society is, um, is something what makes us as human beings complete in emotional and spiritual ways. And that without saying what is right or wrong, or um, uh, we do this, we do this in, a, in, a, in, in the most subtle way, what people can do. Yeah. And, um, and so that makes us that makes us um, a little bit um, more. Uh, how, can, how can I say this? It's it is it is the connection between between the human being and something what is somehow in divinity. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so it's not that there's no question that it is totally important and that we need it because we we. Uh, we always did in all in all the history of human beings. We we had to do this. We had to give ourselves uh, an, an 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 expression. We yes. needed to do that. In the first moment, a man was giving a rose to a woman. With, with art was was created. Yeah. Yes. We, because and and that's and that's so everything is. This is important. This is not just. A rose giving somewhere. It is. It's a symbolization of 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 what what um, uh, of the spirit the spirituality. What 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 mankind is is about. Mm -hmm. And so and this actually, I always try to um, this kind of necessity. I try to to give into my my opera and also in my symphonic work something what what keeps us. Um, um, what keeps us into uh, a higher way of expression of of uh, of mankind? I I I, I couldn't agree more. Sorry, I, I I, 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 <laughs> no, it's it's so it's so wonderfully so wonderfully phrased, and I I suppose my question within that would be. I'm particularly interested in this thought about listeners and about what listening is within within what you've just said. Allowing the space. Do you? Th I mean, do you feel that there are challenges now for us as performers, musicians, composers to create spaces for that kind of listening? Yes, I mean, we we really have to, and we. Um should never should never stop to because i mean with music of course music is just something it's it's not like like um, you cannot weight it yeah you cannot you cannot say okay this are 80 grams or this are one mm -hmm. kilo or this is a quarter pounder or whatever you can, you cannot do this with with music or with art so it's it's uh, uh, what we do and what we what we deal with is something which which is which is invisible, which is not yes. not really um, not really there, but that's what makes it so um, special, so totally mm -hmm. special, and mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think um, without always uh, somehow you need to create with the music a space where uh, what the listener can define as a space too and really wants to move and go into this kind of space mm -hmm. and 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 um and not but not by that you that you take him and guide him through it you just you just offer something and then he can find any kind of um himself uh, uh or even put him on another level or even on, on a lower level but give some experience 
that that leads you in the best way like when we listen to beethoven symphony mm -hmm. it really pushes up to another level and to yeah. and and it makes us to to um to a more complete human being i would not even say a better one but to a more complete one and that's that's what i think uh what i always try to do with all of my all of my works mm -hmm. to shape to shape somehow a framework you know where you can yes. where you can walk in and where you discover something what you cannot discover with 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 anything else yeah yeah um i i also read somewhere that beethoven is a big influence for you it, it particularly with his approach to structural thinking can you talk a little bit about about that now now that we brought beethoven into the room <laughs> <clears throat> yes um, uh, although he's He's always there, so somehow I need to get him out of the room. Especially this year, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yes, there is this, there is this incredible, powerful force um, of of somebody who um, who was fighting with the with the structure. Like um, um, if we if we take the Fifth Symphony, where the whole symphony is built just with this falling falling uh, third yeah <coughs> interval and um, so he he reduces everything to one idea and then he he creates with this one idea on an, an entire galaxy an entire complex um, uh, uh, world which which um, yeah which always has a very rhythmical force for him too Mm -hmm. um, which I which I admire very like because it, because it makes uh, the experience of music very physical, yeah. And mm -hmm. um, the um, and music is something physical for me, yeah. At least. yeah. And um, it will be for for a singer like you. Uh, well, it's and, vibration. <laughs> yeah, and and, uh, and and a pianist, uh, of course, too. And mm -hmm. um, and I. Uh, and I think with, with Beethoven, he always has something in his pieces, some moment where where he where he puts in some a twist or something where, where you just think, ah, oh, this is this is uh, this makes it very difficult to play all of his piano sonatas. There, there is some moment where you think, I cannot play this shit. There is something yes. what just is not physical right. And I always think. <laughs> <laughs> he does this somehow in in to um, to get you even more into the piece, and that you need to work on this piece and fight for this piece the same way he composed it. Yeah, right. Because it's it's yeah. old, like like old recordings from with uh, Rudolf Sakin, for instance. I yeah. heard him as a young boy here in Berlin in the the in the Philharmonic Hall with the late um, um, with the three late uh, piano sonatas. And okay. this was this was really like an experience. Maybe it was because I was so young. I don't know. But it was an, an experience with Beethoven's piano music. I, which was so unique because I had the feeling that these pieces were created right in this moment. There was there was something. Um, Sakin, mm -hmm. he was really with his hands. He was modeling. The, the harmonies he was modeling the rhythms it, it has a it, it had a drive and and um, uh, and a huge risk and it was very often not perfect but it was it was something what uh, what I barely hear these days yeah. that's in, that's such an incredible image actually just to say that you actually feel you witness the music being created in that moment because of that physical struggle and that physical, the physicality of it as well. Because, I mean, what, what we all know about Beethoven's life and um, <clears throat> I mean, I did my, uh, I think it was my opera number 10. I'm a little confused now myself, <laughs> <laughs> which was uh, um, Theater and, and Theater an der Wien, uh, Egmont. Oh, yes, um, yes. In February, that was uh, the last, uh, the last one. What what happened before the um, that happened before the lockdown here in Germany? 
um, my other opera in, in Geneva um, still made it uh, to this point. Uh, so oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it was, it was uh, we had to stop the production uh, two weeks okay. uh, before the premiere. Yeah, it was very, was painful for, for all of us. Yeah. And um, no, but I, but I wanted to say, so, so Beethoven has lived mm -hmm. literally in Theater an der Wien. And uh, uh, Fidelio was premiered there and the Ninth Symphony and Mr. Solemnis. So, so lots of pieces he, he or parts of the pieces he composed in the basement of this theater. Yeah. So it was a very special moment for me to be there. And, and uh, uh, I could not say that I felt the spirit if I really felt it or if it was just telling me, oh, wow, he was here. I had to. <laughs> yeah. It could be this, this too. I, I, uh, I don't know. But, but I was looking at some, some scores and at some scores of the piano sonatas with me when, when I was there. And I always, even when I conduct some of his symphonies, I always feel this struggle of getting to the point as clear as possible in his pieces. And he does this really by reducing the material as much, as much, as much as he can. You know, like, like uh, Giacometti, the sculpturist. Yes. Who, who, who started with a two meters block of, of, uh, uh, yeah. of stuff and tried to make a, a, a sculpture out of it. And then at the end, it was like, it was like this big. It was... Yeah. Uh, this is for me always the perfect example of reducing, 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 and come to the to the to the core of of something. And with with Beethoven pieces, they are always at the core. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's it's not, um, uh, and that's that's what always drives me, and why why I why he is such a big inspiration, and mm -hmm. I. I would love to have a conversation with him and to fight with him about something. And he, okay. he would be he would be a very a very important voice for our time too now. Some mm -hmm. somebody who who could kick some who could kick some necessary the necessary things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh um I'd love I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about the the um Zweimal Huren series because this is a very cool concept and yeah just tell us a little bit about that concept and about how what that experience has sort of shown you it's a it's a series we do <coughs> here at the concertos in berlin where we play uh, a contemporary piece mm -hmm. um actually chamber a chamber piece from one up to five six musicians should shouldn't be more once i had uh, uh a choir too with, with 12 people and and once we did it with a uh, full orchestra too but actually mainly it is uh, chamber music and um, the audience does not really know what kind of piece we play yeah and mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, uh, I always try to in invite uh, wonderful uh, performers like uh, Gidon Kremer and uh, Vivian Hagner and uh, Johannes Moser and so people like this. And um, some were very good uh, partners in talking and some a little less. Uh, and uh, so they play their piece at the beginning, which, mm -hmm. is, which is usually between 10 and 20 minutes long. And then um, I talk with the performer about this piece and we really go, try to go inside and we talk about 30 up to 45 minutes. And then after this conversation, they play it again. And by doing so, the very, the very good ones, they play totally differently. Oh, the they do. Yes. Oh, interesting. Yes. I, I had I also some, some uh, performers there who even played um, less, uh, how can I say, not always to the better. Yeah. Some did, uh, some do very, very much better after, and some do even not so good after the talk. <laughs> but somehow, or maybe they got distracted by 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 the stuff I was trying yeah. to get out of them. What 
why that they choose this piece or why yeah. um, uh, uh, or what's the what's the main goal for them and how do they how often do they perform it and stuff like this but there is always for the audience also um, uh, it's fantastic because they hear it the first time and then usually if I look around in the faces they look at ah, what is yeah. this? Oh, mm, ah, okay so and then after the talking there's total total uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 concentration and total focus on how it sounds like and then uh, uh, the best thing is after the second time hearing it uh, some people say oh no I would even love to hear the third fourth and yeah, and um, so this this we um, it's for me always the, the question to to talk about this this kind of music which is rather difficult and complex sometimes too. But um, lots of my audience have are, are just music lovers. They do not know what what. Uh, uh, what, how we define certain chords or uh, how a structure is built or what, how a contrapoint works or whatever uh, to make it very simple now. But, but um, uh, it's always to, have, to, to need to have a line um, which is uh, uh, to the benefit of the piece and to the benefit of the audience that they can understand um, uh, the yes. complex stuff also the the emotional stuff and also <laughs> what is behind yeah. behind this work or all the composer or the composer yeah. yeah i think that's just it's so it's so fascinating because it it's one of the only things i know that exists like this where you actually give your audience a chance a second chance with the piece and like you say it's so important because the second chance usually means the third and the fourth but if you don't give it the second you know Yes, and you know the, the, the problem really in, in normal in normal um, classic concerts, yeah, where yeah. you have uh, um, the the uh, some kind of work at the beginning, and then you have the the uh, sometimes Small. the contemporary piece, yeah, yeah. and, and then oh, yeah. the vision, and then you have a symphony afterwards. So, <laughs> and then you hear this contemporary piece only once, and then it's. You do not really know what yeah. often what to think about it, or then you think, oh yeah, it somehow hit me. But mm -hmm. and then it's for the for the for the critique. It's the it's the same thing, you know. They just hear it once, and they do not even uh, they do not even saw the score. Yeah. So they do not even know if what the orchestra is playing is right. <laughs> also. <laughs> yeah. But of course, they blame it to the composer at the end. Oh yes, yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, and even if it is right, that doesn't mean that it is played the way it should be, or that for the musicians too, a, a work always needs time to to get into the air, you know. Yeah. And and uh, um, uh, it's 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 always very strange <laughs> and funny too. If you perform a piece in Berlin. And then you, you make another performance in München, in Munich. Mm -hmm. Already, although the orchestra, it's a different orchestra in München, and then haven't even heard the piece before, you know, the premiere. Mm -hmm. But still, they do it much more easy than the orchestra who did the first performance. Because it somehow has this, has this it is it is in the air i don't know what it is but i well, experienced with it so makes me it makes me also think it's about trust right it's about somehow that's the word that came to mind trust for the musicians with the piece trust for the listeners you know yes but i mean that this is nothing what you can really trust you know it's because you yeah. you cannot you cannot uh, um I think this system is, is is somehow problematic too, and it, it's not really mm -hmm. that what what it is. It's not really satisfying for the audience. It is for for me now as a as a settled somehow composer. Mm -hmm. It's uh, uh, for me the work is done when the piece is composed. I actually do not need to know it, need to hear it, yeah, somehow because I uh, the greatest moments I have composing it. And and the the 
it's a, it's something what I discovered particular now in the in the in the COVID nineteen time yeah. that uh, my opera who was not performed yeah it's the first time that I have a, a full size opera which is just here but and it's it's not going to be performed and I it it might be it, well they say that they will do it in twenty three or something and there was supposed to be the the German premiere uh, in Karlsruhe uh, next um, uh, next May, but uh, yesterday I heard they cancelled it because I don't know. Probably it has to do with with the restrictions or whatever. Oh, wow. <clears throat> so, but still, uh, yeah. of course, I would love to hear this piece, yeah, live. But yeah. the moment when I compose and, and create something and have the feeling, oh, wow, now, now it's really flowing somehow. This is, this is the best. And these are the moments where, why I'm a composer. I, I really have to say it, it might be now that, that if some orchestra managers now listen, oh, okay, then we do not have to play his music if he doesn't want to. That's not, that's not what I mean. But yeah. even though it still would not stop me to compose, to continue to compose. And I still would have the greatest moments when I compose and not when I sit in the audience or even when I conduct uh, uh, mm. what, what I do quite often too. Yeah. Um, but then you always have to talk to, to deal with all these human things, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, which, which is, uh, 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 which is funny and nice too, but as a, as a, Composer, it's, it's the the focus and the moment mm. of writing something. This is this is pure joy. <laughs> Fascinating. Well, Christian, it's it's just been such a pleasure to hear 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 your thoughts and your and a bit of your yeah a bit of your journey. And really, thank you so much for thank your you. time yes. and. Um, I would love to ask you the sort of last final question that I, because of the title of the show, um, yeah. which is, when has music been revolutionary for you personally? Or has it? Uh, revolutionary, you, you mean um, uh, within my work or just with-, with uh... Within, I mean, I would ask you on a like personal level, but also we could, uh, we could also say when could music potentially be revolutionary for people but I'm curious yeah what when it was revolutionary for you well I must say that actually what, what I, this, this this experience with uh, Rudolf Zerking with the with the three late Beethoven sonatas it was for me just bam yeah because mm -hmm. I really had the had the feeling of I'm in Beethoven's head right mm -hmm. in this moment yeah and yeah. so this this was uh, um, I don't know if, if you can call this a revolution and revolutionary moment, but it somehow changed my thinking. Yeah. Yes. And that's what what a what a revolution in a good way. Um, if your thinking changes in a in a better way, it can also <laughs> right. for some people go in, into the wrong direction or whatever. No, but uh, but this and. Um, uh, 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 this was one of these key moments, but but um, uh, I must say I have that um, uh, always when I when I when I hear um, an artist a performer doing something where, when he is or he or she I'm sorry is really into that what she is doing. Mm -hmm. And then it can never be wrong, too. Mm -hmm. Then it's always right. That's what I tell uh, my mm -hmm. performers of my stuff, too. When they say, ah, do it, uh, do it, am I doing it the right way? And is that what you had in mind? I said, no. It's not about to try to imitate something what you might think what I had in mind. No, yeah. this, this is uh, something you need to get it into a system. You need to digest it and then if it comes out uh, as something of you then it's right <laughs> it can't be wrong you know and and uh, uh, maybe to let to to really to accept that that art is not 
is not something what is necessary. Art is something what makes us complete. Maybe if we get this more into the heads of in, and the heads and the souls of the people, then uh, uh, then this is re revolutionary enough. <laughs> I love that. Wow. <laughs> yes. Yes. I don't think I have. I can't say anything else. <laughs> so, <laughs> Christian, thank you yeah. so much for joining thank us. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So take good care and uh, stay healthy. Yes, you too. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And thanks everyone for tuning in. See you next week.